Aha, the web browser. That magical bit of software you use every single day, but probably never think about. All the good stuff, everything you actually want to see is inside that little frame, like a window to the super wholesome World Wide Web. But recently, I was working hard on a very important project, and I started wondering, where did the browser even come from? I know they kicked off about 30 years ago in the 90s, but that's about it. And as you've probably seen on this channel, I love checking out legendary old tech. And nothing screams legendary tech like Internet Explorer 6. So I'm gonna test out a bunch of classic browsers to see if anything has actually changed over the last 30 years. And hopefully answer the age old question, why is every single browser pretty much just Chrome? Seriously, almost all of them. Well, I guess we're gonna find out because you're watching Legendary Tech. Here's the thing about browsers. These days, they're pretty straightforward. They're pretty simple. They're essentially just invisible, right? Kind of like plumbing or electricity. You can only really notice a browser if it starts to break. And God knows, they break. But it wasn't always like this. See, back in the mid 90s, during the dot-com era, browsers were the wild west of software development. And it all started with Netscape. See, Netscape's IPO in August 1995 was kind of insane. The company went public and their stock price doubled on the first day, from $28 to $58. Suddenly, everyone kind of realized the internet was going to be a pretty big thing. And if the internet was going to be huge, then browsers, the gateway to the internet, were going to be worth millions, if not billions of dollars. You had browsers like Opera from Norway, Microsoft's Internet Explorer, Sun's Hot Java, Web TV for your television, each one with its own rendering engine, its own ID about what the internet experience should be. So I started digging to try and get my head around this crazy era of browsers. However, the more I researched, the more I realized that all of these browsers kind of just disappeared. What happened to all the crazy stuff they were building and dreaming about in the 90s? Well, to find out, we need to go all the way back and check out some old browsers. Okay, the first browser we're checking out is Mosaic. The first browser that people could actually use Already, the first thing I've noticed is that it really doesn't look that different to browsers we have right now. You've got your basic buttons back, forward, you've got a home button, you got a refresh, I think. Yeah, I did. And then you've got a save. So I guess you could save the whole web page. But to understand why Mosaic was so revolutionary for the time, we need to talk about what existed before it. See, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web in 1989, but it was just text. Hyperlinks, but no images, no formatting, no fun, if you ask me. <laughs> but Mosaic introduced the IMG tag, the image tag, pictures right inside web pages. This was insane for the time. Developed at the University of Illinois' National Center for Supercomputing Applications, Mosaic made the web visual for the first time. And within months, Wired was saying it changed the way people thought of the web, giving it some personality rather than just information. Mosaic truly changed everything. Suddenly the web wasn't just for researchers, it was for everyone. This is where the browser wars began. Oh, this absolute chungus of a laptop is the Toshiba Satellite Pro, uh, made around the time of Windows 95. Dude, could you imagine actually using this as a laptop? This thing would hardly work on my desk, especially given how messy and chaotic my desk already is. I've got laptop chargers, phone chargers, random USB chargers everywhere. So to try to keep some of this chaos organized, I'm using this Nexo desktop charger from Ugreen. This bad boy uses GAN technology to pack 100 watts into something that's so freaking tiny and can just sit on my desk. And it gives it more efficient charging, as well as being made with reduced manufacturing materials. It's got all the usual suspects of a banger U-Green charger. Its USB-C port can reliably deliver up to 100 watts, perfect for keeping my MacBook Pro charged while editing, as well as USB-A for you old school legends. And by far the best feature, your phone can sit right on top with 15 watt MagSafe charging. So now I can give everything a place on my desk. One charger, three devices. Hey, this thing would actually be sick for travel as well. So if you're looking for a super solid charger, check out the link in my description and thank you so much to you Green for supporting this video. Next up on our list of classic browsers is Netscape Navigator. Released in 1994, this browser basically owned the internet. Oh, this is a nostalgia hit. Founded by Mark Anderson, one of Mosaic's original developers, and Jim Clark from Silicon Graphics. They raised 25 million before they even had a finished product. And their internal code name, Mozilla. Mosaic plus Godzilla. And their team moved fast. See, JavaScript was invented in just 10 days by Brandon Eek. They were adding features weekly. Lou Montulli invented cookies in 1994 just to make shopping carts work. 
we're starting to get into Internet Explorer territory here. Plus, the browser wars got personal too. In 1997, Microsoft's Internet Explorer team literally planted a giant metal Internet Explorer logo on Netscape's lawn. Netscape employees knocked it over and put their Mozilla dinosaur mascot on top. Bro, what a weird, what a weird time of technology. But as sick as these old web browsers are, I kind of want to understand what it was like to make websites back in the day. So I jumped on a call with Ken Grief. Ken's been writing code for a couple decades. And after successfully selling his last business, he started building a new tool for content creators. And I recently joined their team to help build their app, Clipflow. Dude, when did you start coding and why did you start doing web dev? My first like experience with writing code was, I, it's so vivid. I remember it was like, I wrote HTML, in South Africa, probably would have been 12 years old, maybe 10 to 12 years old um, on in notepad.exe. Yes. All the OGs know how to write a website in notepad.exe. And it was just literally building HTML, changing the background colors and just being like, this is actual witchcraft. What am I doing here? <laughs> and mm -hmm. So how the heck did you learn it, dude? Where, mm -hmm. where are you reading from? Uh, right click, in, I'm pretty sure it was like inspect source, but it wasn't right click no inspect way. source. They didn't have dev tools at that time. So we went, to, I think it was view page source. I think that was built yeah. into those browsers at that time. What was the first browser you remember? Oh, like see, I was probably, to be honest, it was probably IE, like Internet Explorer, yeah. so which is dead. Windows XP, mate. Yeah, that, Windows oh, XP. I love Windows. Oh, it's so oh, good. <laughs> Best version of Windows, I reckon. Easy. Ever. Microsoft threw their hat in the ring in 1995 with Internet Explorer. But here's the thing. Microsoft didn't build this web browser from scratch. They licensed code from a Spyglass Mosaic for $2 million. But when they bundled IE with Windows 95 and it became freaking massive, Spyglass realized they undersold themselves and demanded another $8 million. See, Microsoft didn't just compete. They made Internet Explorer impossible to remove from Windows. And by 1999, they had nearly 95% market share. That's not competition. That's full on like conquest, bro. You know what? I'll give it to Internet Explorer. It is quite clean. Oh, that is nice. Give me some modular design. Oh, I freak, I crashed. I cr Did I crash it? I think I might have crashed it. <laughs> Again, this is so throwback iconic for me, but really not a lot's changed between the browsers. I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, even emails, emails didn't look that different from now. Think about how much technology has changed in the last five years. The fact that this hasn't changed much in the last 30 is freaking nuts to me. I mean, Internet Explorer 6 looks pretty much the same as all the other Internet Explorers. For five years, Microsoft basically stopped updating it. No tabs, terrible security, and broken CSS. Developers called it the least secure software on the planet. Even Microsoft eventually created an IE6 countdown website to celebrate killing their own browser. Trying to really dig deep to see if anything's changed visually or even functionality wise, but I cannot really tell. But then came along a browser called Opera. See, while these giants were fighting it out over browsers, this little Norwegian company called Opera was quietly building the most advanced browser in the world. Starting as a research project, it introduced mouse gestures, speed dial, built an email, pop-up blocking, tab browsing. They invented features that browsers still don't have today. Now, this isn't the oldest version of Opera. It's a bit hard to get the very first version of Opera running on anything. Uh, but this is Opera 12, just so you can have an idea of how it looked. And again, we just have these browsers getting cleaner and cleaner in their looks and simpler. This feels more like a modern browser than all the others so far. But under the hood, Opera built their own engine called Presto. It was fast, standards compliant, and completely independent. But yeah, obviously tab browsing was a big change for using the internet, switching between tabs. Something that I take for granted right now was a big deal back then. And Opera was one of the first to do it. And they were a pretty quirky team too. In 2005, the CEO promised to swim from Norway to the US if Opera 8 hit a million downloads in four days. So when it did, he actually jumped in the freaking Norwegian ocean. I mean, he didn't swim the whole Atlantic, but still. Big props. Next up, we're checking out Firefox. Released in November 2004, the open source rebellion against IE's monopoly was real. But this wasn't just an open source project. When AOL killed Netscape after its purchase in 2003, they open sourced the code to Mozilla Foundation. Firefox literally rose from Netscape's ashes. So dramatic. They had zero corporate marketing budget. They just had passionate users. And they crowdfunded a full-page ad in the New York Times. And on June 17, 2008, Firefox 3 set a Guinness World Record, 8 million downloads in 24 hours. The game was back on. Firefox had some deep features like extensions, themes, complete customization. And Firefox proved that the web could be open and that users wanted choice. By 2010, Firefox had peaked around 30% market share, helping break 
like Internet Explorer's stranglehold on the market. But I dig this man, I was always a Firefox kid. Okay, similar layout to Opera. We've got tab browsing up top here. Obviously a big part of Firefox was add-ons and extensions. And so that made it so much fun to use as a kid. I'm pretty sure I had like a Doctor Who theme. Super sick. <laughs> Now I have a newer version of Firefox over here that I'm installing on Windows XP. And let's see how much Firefox changed even in its few years. Oh, that logo. Oh, that logo gives me some good feels, man. I don't know about you, but the internet just felt wholesome back then. What happened to it? <laughs> Wait, I don't remember this. I don't remember that massive double thick <laughs> blue bar. What the heck? But again, man, browsers were just getting simpler and simpler. Oh, I dig everything about this. The way the tabs kind of sit back there, then on the way your main tab is focused. This is good, dude. This is a good time. Meanwhile, a little company called Apple was quietly working on Safari. Steve Jobs hated Internet Explorer on Mac and wanted something better. But here's the brilliant part. Instead of building from scratch, they took KHTML from KDE's Conqueror browser on Linux. Apple forked KHTML into WebKit in 2003. This little known open source engine became the foundation for Safari. Okay, let's check out Safari. And to do that, we're gonna get out the big boy. <laughs> Holy smokes. Uh, last time I turned it on, things didn't work great. So <laughs> let's see if we can try out Safari. She's still got life. Oh man, I've done so much random stuff with this iMac. I know this web browser very intimately. That sounds super weird, I don't... <laughs> and gosh, it looks good. I know I keep saying this and coming back to it, but it's so nuts to me that the browsers themselves, the functionality itself, is ultimately the same. What we see on the outside is the same. Now, of course, what's going on inside is fundamentally different for every browser engine, which is what's running under the hood. But I must admit, using Safari on my mate's iMac way back in the day and playing RuneScape was just one of the first times my brain was like, this is the future. And then things really kicked off in 2007. Apple put Safari on the first iPhone as mobile Safari. For the first time, a phone could display the real web, not watered down mobile pages. It really did change everything. But here's where it gets kind of interesting. Apple's WebKit forked from Conqueror's KHTML would eventually be forked again by Google into something called Blink. In September 2008, Google announced Chrome. I remember the day so clearly. I downloaded it the day it came out. But how did Google get here? See, they'd been paying Mozilla millions to make Google the default search in Firefox. But Larry Page and Sergey Brin realized something pretty crucial. And this is something we're starting to hear more and more again. If the web was becoming the platform, then the browser was the new operating system. Chrome was a game changer for browsers. Each tab had its own process. So when one crashed, other tabs kept running. It wouldn't kill the entire application. But one of the most underrated features, in my opinion, was the V8 JavaScript engine, which made web apps as fast as desktop software. And it was all built on WebKit, so it had instant compatibility. The very first version of Google Chrome. I thought as a kid that this was the sleekest, best looking browser I'd ever seen. It felt like the next unlock for the internet. But as you can see, things just got simpler and simpler. All we have are the tabs, search bar, forward and back buttons, a refresh, and then page settings and your general browser settings. I mean, that's it. There's really not a lot to look at here. Why was Chrome such a big deal, or Blink such a big deal for like web development? I was a big Firefox fanboy. Yeah. Massively, I love developing Firefox because what you used to get in the olden days was well, in the olden days, <laughs> the olden in my days, uh, was you'd have incompatibility. And you're kind of starting to see this crawl through again now with Safari and WebKit and Blink, but everyone's building on Blink. Like everyone's moved to that, so it's now created this like everyone gets the same render. But what would happen is you'd render something on one browser and it'd look completely different. So especially with IE6 and the IE7 times, you'd literally have hacks in your CSS where you'd have to do different things for browsers. Like I think Chrome came and was really good with supporting all the web standards. They invested yeah, okay. a lot of time in that. And they also brought in experimental features. You know, like think yeah. about having video in the browser. That's yes. new. What we're yes. doing right now is new. You could never do this. Supporting all those different standards and as they come up, Chrome was always kind of leading the charge there and that's where they started leaving people like Firefox behind. And here's where we're at right now 
30 years later. Modern browsers are all powered by either Blink, WebKit, or Gecko engines. Blink has about 80% market share through Chrome, Edge, Opera, Brave, Arc, well, rest in peace. WebKit has about 15% through Safari and all iOS browsers. And Gecko has about 5% through Firefox. Three engines running the entire web for billions of people. It can't be that hard to build a browser, right? <laughs> Like, <laughs> to be honest, it, it is quite hard, actually. But yeah. the problem with the web is that it needs to be backwards compatible. So a website okay. written when we were 12 needs to be running today. And that's the beauty of the web. That actual engine that does all that work is such a... I think it's like 40 gig of code. Oh. I was reading uncompressed. So like the fact they can get a browser down to your, onto your computer for a couple or maybe even a gig, like probably less, yeah. is, an, is an impressive feat. But that piece there is so complicated. So that's why no one writes browser engines to build so that you've got multiple parts here. So you can see you've got the HTML, which is the structure, you've got the CSS rendering engines. Then you've also got all the security, all the protocols that we have to talk. So we're talking HTTPS, we're talking, yep. um, you could be talking through a web socket. All of these things have to be maintained by the browser. There's a whole bunch of stuff here that's just more than just the UI which you see. See, Internet Explorer's tried an engine, it was discontinued. Netscape's original engine, completely dead. Opera's innovative Presto, abandoned and Microsoft's Edge HTML surrendered. Even Mozilla's experimental servo was shelved. Each one killed by the same thing, the impossible complexity of the modern web. As the web got more powerful, only the biggest companies could afford to keep up. All the personality, all the wild experimentation of the dot-com era absorbed into three massive giants. So do you think anyone will ever build another web engine, browser engine, or is this it? I think that the web's changing. Like mm. if, with AI and stuff, the way that we interact with data and information is changing. The, the investment required is so big. Like if you look at Google, how much money they have and, and you go like, who else could do that? Not many. Why do you need a web engine when you're looking at stuff through a VR glasses? Yeah. Or if you're consuming information through a headset. Yeah. Or, you know, like the way we consume information will change. I don't think someone's going to come and build a new Blink. But throughout this journey of using these old browsers, here's what I've discovered. We're not just looking at browser history here. We're looking at how technology builds on itself in layers. A really basic example is like electricity becomes silicon, becomes assembly code, becomes operating systems, which turns into browsers, which turns into web apps. And that's where we're at now. With the exception of a few apps, everything I use for work is done in my browser. And the experience is indistinguishable from using a desktop app. Browser engines have become the platform. They've become the new operating system. And when you have three engines running that entire platform, well, that's how you end up with every browser being Chrome. <laughs> and maybe the browser wars ending wasn't the death of innovation. Maybe it was the beginning of the next layer. And with companies like the browser company abandoning Arc to focus on AI, they're focusing on the next layer, at least from what I can tell. The internet has come such a long way. It's come so far. And I don't know about you, but I miss those old school browsers. I miss the internet in the early 2000s.